Today we're going to talk about the classification of life on Earth. This chapter we're moving into is a quick survey of all the living things that are out there, the bizarre, the mundane, um, and how we've named everything. So classification is something that people do just by being people. We like to know the names of things. We, our friends have names. Our pets have names. Everything's got a name. Uh, we've been naming living things since we've been hunting them and growing them uh, and had to know about them but, and been hunted by them. Um, but scientific classification of living things didn't begin until the 1700s. And the gentleman that's attributed to this um, endeavor is Carolus Linnaeus, who's pictured here on the screen. Uh, Carolus published Systema Natura back in the mid-1700s. He's the grandfather of what we call organized taxonomy. He classified all living things into categories, the broadest of which was kingdom and the most specific, which was species. So humans, for example, were, were put into kingdom uh, animalia back in... Uh, Linnaeus's time, there were only two kingdoms. Today, there's many kingdoms, but there were only plants and animals back then. So humans were in kingdom animalia. We were in phylum chordata. There are more than 15 different phyla of animals, but we are in uh, a phylum called chordata because at least at some point in our life, we had what is called a notochord. It's a rod of cartilage in our back. Um, we're in class uh, mammalia, which is distinct. We have uh, fur and mammary glands, whereas other animals in phylum chordata don't necessarily have that their fish are in there and they don't they're not mammals and reptiles are in phylum chordata and they're not mammals uh the specific mammal type we are humans are is primates so there's a lot of different there must be at least 20 different orders of of mammals uh, humans are in order primates uh, we're a primate forward facing eyes grasping hands stereoscopic vision um, we are in family, uh, hominidae, which, uh, is all the human-like primates and we're in genus homo and species sapiens. Uh, our closest relative is the chimpanzee, which is in the same order. Some people feel the chimp should be in the same family as us, but right now the chimp is in family, uh, pongidae and we're in hominidae. Uh, Linnaeus came up with the famous two word naming system for naming life forms, um, that's based on Latin. So every living thing got a two-word name based on its genus and its species category. So we're, our name is Homo sapiens. Uh, the genus is Homo and the species is sapiens. Uh, you may have heard of Neanderthals. Some biologists call them Homo neanderthalensis. So uh, when you handwrite these, you generally underline them. But when you put them in text, you italicize them. Uh, Linnaeus classified everything by physical features. Um, but today we classify using DNA. DNA technology is considered superior to just physical anatomy. And DNA classification um, has changed how we look at the, the organisms on Earth. Uh, for example, there's uh, an organism commonly known as a water mold that grows underwater on dead and decaying materials. They look like molds, they behave like molds, they grow like molds. But when a DNA analysis was performed, it was found that their closest living relatives were algae. So the water molds are no longer considered a fungus, but instead are considered algae. Um, there are many other examples of where DNA evidence has upturned or overturned what we once thought was a relationship. So phylogenetics is all about classification of life forms. And the current way we do that is with DNA in a process known as cladistics. In cladistics, a binary system is used to compare life forms. And you can use physical features, but ultimately you like to use also DNA features. But just as a very simple example, this is a cladistics matrix comparing a sea star, a sunfish, a bluebird, a dog, and a frog. And we are comparing them on the features of indeterminate development, vertebra, warm-blooded legs and hair. If an animal has these, they get a one. And if they do not have these features, they get a zero. So if we compare the sea star, sunfish, bluebird, dog, and frog on these features, we find that all of them have indeterminate development, which means that when they were embryos very early on, you could actually damage them and they would recover and still grow into a, an actual living thing. Many simpler life forms cannot do that. 
Um, but sea stars, sunfish, bluebirds, dogs, and frogs can do that. So they all get a one. Um, all of these animals also possess vertebra, except the sea star. The sea star has no vertebra. It's actually an invertebrate. Uh, Warm-bloodedness is only possessed by the bluebird and the dog. The other animals do not possess warm-bloodedness, so the only ones there were the bluebird and the dog. Legs, even though sea stars have arms, they don't have jointed legs. Legs are possessed by the bluebird, the dog, and the frog, but not the sea star or the sunfish. Hair is not possessed by any of the life forms except the dog. Now, when we boil this cladistics matrix down, a simple way to look at the classification that results would be with a Venn diagram. The dog goes on the inside of a series of circles. You're going to have one, two, three, four, five circles encompassing these five uh, different life forms. The dog goes on the innermost circle. The dog has ones for all of the features, and it is the inmost group. The closest relative the dog would be the animal in the matrix that has the second highest number of ones which is the bluebird. The bluebird's got four ones. It's missing hair, but it's got ones for everything else. So the bluebird is the next outgroup from the dog. Uh, looking backwards, the frog is next in line. It's got three ones, so it's the next most related. So in the Venn diagram series, it, a circle goes around it and also around the bluebird and the dog. And the same procedure is used for the sunfish. The sea star is the outgroup, the ultimate outgroup in this group, because it possesses the least of all the features that are comparing all these life forms. A cladogram to represent the evolutionary relationships among these life forms based on these features would look like this. We have the evolution of an ancient life form that uh, diverged. In other words, the life form diverged into two different species. One of them led to the sea star and the other species led to animals with a backbone. Uh, this animal with a backbone evolved into sunfish, but also evolved to grow legs, and then evolved some of them into frogs, but then another species evolved warm-bloodedness and became a bluebird, and yet another became a dog. So this cladogram here is trying to represent an evolutionary relationship that the cladistics matrix up here lists. Now, there's no DNA evidence listed in this cladistics matrix, but DNA is the ultimate um, uh, uh, classification tool. If an organism has a gene or, or a particular piece of DNA, it gets a one. If it doesn't have it, it gets a zero. So it, it's done the same way. Uh, but up here, you'd have pieces of DNA listed, and you would be comparing them, the different life forms, based on the pieces of DNA they possess. Now, there's a couple of terms that we use to describe um, the relationships between life for, forms in terms of cladistics. Uh, monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic are terms. Monophyletic describes a group that is complete, meaning the group can, includes ancestors and all descendants from the from that ancestor. So uh, this would this in yellow here. This is a monophyletic group. On the other hand, the lorises and the tarsiers, they are polyphyletic because those two groups. Whoops, shouldn't have clicked there. Those two groups don't include the common ancestor of the loris and the tarsier. And so as a result, we call that a polyphyletic grouping. A, a paraphyletic grouping is where you have, like reptile, which includes diapsids, which are reptiles that have two holes in their head, uh, besides the eyes and the nose, and then the archosaurs, which are the ancient dinosaurs, and the crocodiles and the lizards and the turtles, but not the birds. This particular group in the blue group, you're missing a descendant, but you have all the ancestors and all the other descendants. That's called a paraphyletic uh, grouping. So in, uh, in cladistics, ultimately, we would love everything to be monophyletic, but that's not the way things are. I mean, when you go to the store and you buy a book on uh, reptile identification, it's going to have like lizards and turtles and snakes and crocodiles and things in there, but it's not going to have birds in there. And as a result, we call that book a paraphyletic grouping of animals. And that's just the way that is. No big deal. But we need to, you, it's, it's a reflection on the fact that it's a book on reptiles, but not quite all the reptiles are actually there. Uh, birds actually are reptiles, uh, even though in 
com everyday common use, we usually do not consider them such. But scientifically, technically, they are reptiles because they're descended from them. That is the nature of cladistics. You are what your ancestors have made uh, you. So the tree of life on Earth current, currently consists of three major dominant uh, groups of life. Uh, by far, the archibacteria, which are very uh, small here, uh, rule the world. There are more of these guys by biomass than all the rest of us combined. Um, the, the other life forms, the, the bluish ones here, these are all the bacteria. They are uh, the between the eubacteria and the archibacteria, over 50% of the biomass of Earth is made up. So even though we think that we rule the world, actually in terms of just sheer mass, bacteria rule the world. There are more bacteria in the colon, in the feces in your colon than you have cells in your body. You have bacteria all over your skin. Every day you wash off a layer, but you cannot wash them all off. They're everywhere. Uh, there's bacteria. There are more bacteria in just a small shovel full of dirt than you have in, in your entire body. So the bacteria are everywhere. These are called prokaryotes. They are very simple life forms. They lack complex cellular organization in their cells. They're described over here. The eubacteria in blue are single cell life forms without complex internal organelles. The archaea in green are single cell life forms without co complex organelles, but they don't live in the same place as the eubacteria. Sometimes they do, but a lot of times they don't. Um, the Archaeans live in hot springs or extremely salty oceans like the Great Salt Lake, or they live in the muck at the bottom of a pond where even no eubacteria can live. Uh, in your colon, you have a mixture of eubacteria and archaea. Both of these types are found. Uh, but what we commonly think of as ruling the world is the eukarya, and really the eukarya don't rule the world. Uh, but they are the big life forms that we can see with the naked eye. The fungi, the animals, the slime molds, the plants, the algae, the protozoa, they're all, all of these life forms are large life forms that can either be seen easily microscopically or uh, with the naked eye. The eukarya are different in that we have very complex cell organization. So our cells are way more complicated than the cells of the bacteria that are in, like, say, our colons. Uh, and that makes us vastly different. Um, you could fit thousands of these bacteria in a single one of your cells. So that basically is a summary of classification. Uh, we'll talk more about this in class. I will see you in class next time. Talk to you later.